Okay, we see the people are joining. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Emma Schaffer-Mann and in the next hour, I, we will be hosting the webinar on the pathway to positive, for us positive supply chains. We will start with the presentation of CDP, uh, providing an overview of EU legislative developments on deforestation. He will provide, Marco will provide us um, an overview of the upcoming legislation with a reflection on what it means for companies and what our perspective is on the role of certific certification schemes in the new regulated market. After that, Marco will present briefly the CDP forest approach, how it can support private and public sector actors, and the question as pathway to forest positive supply chains. After, Jasper from Blanc Consultants will uh, focus on the consumer perspective and the environmental footprint labeling. We will have time at the end for a Q&A session, so please feel free to enter your questions in the chat. Before we jump into the great presentations, let me um, inform you about the logistics of today briefly. So you will be all put on mute to avoid any background noises disturbing the presentations. Um, the webinar will also be recorded and together with the presentation shared after the webinar um, and today we're together with the presentation and the recording. And please, as mentioned, don't share to, don't be afraid to share your ideas or questions. You can do it by using the chat function or also at the end by raising your hand. So very briefly, um, introducing Proterra for those who are not familiar maybe with our work and what we do. So the Proterra Foundation is a Dutch uh, foundation um, and it is the owner of the Proterra Standard. Next to the Proterra standard also developed regional interpretations and a smallholder interpretation. The mission of the Proterra Foundation is to be a global network of businesses supporting more sustainable agriculture practices in the feed and food supply chains, um, where relevant the conversion to non-GMOs and for respect of workers and communities dignity. And we envisage a world where all businesses contribute to the protection of biodiversity by switching to sustainable production, conserving natural resources, and ensuring that local communities are treated with dignity and respect. The Proterra Foundation is an organization that promotes sustainability at all levels of the feed and food supply chain and the production system. Um, the Proterra standard is a globally applicable multi-crop standard. And I would just like to show you a few slides just quickly where we operate today. So you can see with green, the greenly indicated countries are where we have certification is going on today. Um, you see that really there is a widespread different countries and also different crops. If we go more into the detail on, um, on soy, you see that also Europe is growing of growing importance but the biggest volumes are still coming from South America today. The buyer market and the markets of destination are usually in the European Union. Um, that's valid for both soy and sugarcane. Those are the company's locations where um, mostly sustainable raw materials are required, but we also observe that more and more companies also in the US and other continents are more aware of the sustainable development and request this also from their suppliers. Um, we have, we face an increasing number of challenges today and companies um, in their everyday business. So we are also there to support them and help manage and mitigate risks. These are just a few examples of the main areas the standard focuses on. It's um, divided in 10 principles and covers all important area of the sustainability. Last but not least, I would like to share with you some links that may be relevant and are connected also to today's webinar's theme. The first one is actually an update of 
a project that we call the MRV project, it's a monitoring and verification project. Um, some of you may know that we have an aquaculture working group um, working on sustainable soy and raw materials coming from overseas and deforestation free. Um, and there was a big historical move last year when uh, three big crushers and exporters, CJ Select, Karmaru, and Incopa committed actually to their entire supply to become land conversion free with a cutoff date of 2020. The newest uh, publication has been just done a um, few days ago. So here you can find the link and we invite every company to join the project and to support the project that may be interested in also improving um, sustainable supply chains and uh, and uh, maybe implementing this also for other crops. So what is, what is actually the main goal of this project? It's really a historical move because it shows that sector-wide collaboration is possible. We have really the commitment from all the companies, including the buyers that are especially today fishery producers, but as I said, all companies, retailers are invited to join us. And the commitment calls for promotion of um, soy supply chains free from illegal or legal land conversion. We focus on respecting the rights of workers, indigenous peoples, and local communities. So it has also a social element next to the land conversion, which is the main focus of the project. And it is important that it's also national and local environmental laws and regulations are respected. Another um, topic briefly is the um, carbon footprint calculation, because in the free agriculture and free production contest, LCA is increasingly levered irrelevant. And in certain countries and markets, it's even mandatory to deliver carbon footprint data to stakeholders in the value chain. So over the years, we have carried out many projects to cover this demand and report on environmental impact of agriculture and feed products, starting with carbon footprint indicator of soy, beans and soy derived um, products. In partnership with external experts such as Blanc, who is with us today, we developed a tool and calculate GHG emissions, um, compromising methods to estimate land use change and the resulting GHG rates. The main objective actually of this project is to differentiate from non-certified products by providing buyers and our members with primary data or portero specific data for the calculation of GHGs. So they can also show and use these numbers in their sustainability report and towards their customers. And now, this, I would like to introduce our lovely speakers today. We will start with the presentation of Marco, who is the regional lead of Forest at CDC, CDP Europe. He drives effective private and public sector action to eliminate deforestation caused by the production of forest risk commodities. Marco works with companies, investors, and policymakers to establish deforestation free supply chains and to stimulate collective action to protect intact ecosystems and to restore the degraded ones for a nature positive future. So his role is very important to make our world a better place. And then we will follow with the presentation of Jasper. He has the over a decade experience in consultancy and research with regards to environmental and sustainability issues of food production systems. He has graduated the Wageningen University here in the Netherlands in animal sciences and animal production systems. And he manages the consulting department at Blanc, which includes LCA studies, the development of LCI databases, LCA reviews, and standard development, such as PEF, as many of you know it. So with this, I would like to give the word to Marco. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Anise, and. Uh... Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, being here. 
Indeed, a, a critical transition is needed and we cannot avoid the challenge. We know that despite the pledges by hundreds of government companies, the annual rate of gr gross tree cover loss has increased of 43% between 2000 and 2018, reaching over 26 million hectares per year. And 2022 is likely to see another increase in the rate of uh, uh, tropical deforestation in the Amazon. And deforestation is not a standalone issue, but it is interlinked in an ex inextricable way with multiple environmental issues, such as the climate emergency and pressure that our uh, society puts on nature. We know that deforestation is the source of uh, 12 to 14% of global greenhouse gas emission, according to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We know that the IPCC found that the mitigation potential of reduced deforestation is up to one third of total global emissions and the pathways to limit global warming to 1.5 cannot be achieved without stopping deforestation and stimulating the restoration of ecosystem. And uh, we know that the companies with forest land and agricultural emission cannot fulfill their 1.5 commitment and reach a nature positive future without cutting all the emission coming from the land system. So I want to reiterate once more the message, there is no 1.5 without forest and land. Europe, going specifically to our continent as a big forest footprint, mainly as a, a major important of, importer of forest commodities and of deforestation potentially embedded into them. And to reduce this pressure created on the world forest due to European consumption, the European Commission supported by companies, investors, industry association, civil society organization, has developed and released the first draft of the EU law uh, which bans products linked to deforestation from the EU market. The draft has been released on Wednesday, 17th of November, 2021. It was informed by a public consultation, which was the second largest of the history of the European Union, giving us the sense on how much European citizens and uh, stakeholders consider the deforestation issue. And 88% per, of the submission were supportive of a regulatory measure as well, giving us the signal that we want a regulation and the creation of a level playing field that can also support businesses, but as well producing countries in stepping up their ambition for deforestation free supply chains. And it is a massive turning point because we go beyond illegal deforestation because this legislation covers as well legal deforestation. And it has implications connected to other regulatory frameworks and the efforts of the European uh, Commission, such as the LULUCF regulations on land use, uh, land use changes and forestry that are part of the energy directive of the European uh, uh, law and uh, the due diligence on sustainable corporate governance. So there are intricacies between the legislation that will play important implications. Next slide, please. But so what does this legislation mean? There are different legislative requirements for companies. Companies and traders involved in the market of forces, commodities, or products containing them, we have to ensure that they are not linked to deforestation and forest degradation. The legislation will introduce to this aim a mandatory due diligence system that require economic operators and large traders to provide geographical information on the plot of land uh, where the commodity is being produced and the list of supplier actually selling that commodity. Mandatory due diligence alone was not enough, according to the different parties of the multi-stakeholder platform on deforestation, and therefore it has been accompanied with a country benchmarking system. And uh, this country benchmarking system will uh, give a different level of risk of deforestation risk to the countries, which will be labeled from high risk to low risk, and uh, due diligence requirement will change according to the level of risk of the countries. 
the cooperation with the partner countries will be fundamental and there will not be any uh, exclusion on any ban on producing countries, but there will be mechanisms to support and stimulate producing countries, stakeholders, small holders to comply with the legislation, even if though there was criticism that was the mechanism implemented were not enough to support this transition. We can add few important information. Uh, the definition used to understand deforestation was taken from FAO, therefore the conversion of forests from agricultural purposes, whether human induced or not. And uh, the, the, the legislation introduced a cut of date of December 2020, which means that the production cannot be linked to land deforested after this date. Again, some criticism that it was not ambitious enough, whilst on the other end, for many, has been considered as to be like quite uh, an ambitious cut of date. So what's the scope of the legislation? Thank you, Emeza. It will cover six purposes commodities responsible for the largest share of commodity driven deforestation. It will interest all producing countries, as I have just said, with no exclusion. And uh, it will have like a, a progressive scope. So we know that uh, uh, several uh, companies and stakeholders have shared concern on why certain commodities were excluded. We can mention natural rubber, we can mention sugar cane, which is of interest for forests. And but the commission stated that the legislation will be updated regularly with new commodities and new ecosystem and new requirements put in place when required. Like that, the scope was defined like that because like up to now, the capacity in the um, assessment exercise was limited and uh, uh, the, the information was enough only to cover these certain commodities and uh, ecosystem. And uh, um, uh, indeed, like the, the, the legislation covers like all economic operators and traders, which are not SMEs. So medium and small size enterprises will have to comply with a different kind of uh, measures. And financial institutions are excluded because the, how this legislation work is focused on commodities and uh, instead like uh, the European Commission has considered to be most relevant for financial institution to be held accountable to reduce their investment in uh, businesses associated to deforestation through the EU uh, green taxonomy. Uh, we will have to talk for like long time about the green taxonomy, maybe another time. Next slide, please. So what is like the impact on the ground that this legislation wants to achieve? The benefit of the legislation are estimated in well above 72,000 hectares of forest loss affected by, of forest less affected by you driven deforestation and forest degradation annually by 2030. And this will also mean like a reduction of at least 31.9 million metric, metric tons of carbon emission to the atmosphere every year due to uh, European consumption and production of the relevant commodities that can be translated into an economic saving of at least 3.2 billion euros annually. Next slide, please. What are the weak spots? As we have mentioned, there were, was already like some criticism. I can mention some highlighted also from our organization from CDP. Natural rubber indeed was excluded while it drives like a lot of deforestation, especially in Southeast Asia. Many important ecosystems such as the Savannah and the Cerrado affected by deforestation due to soil production was excluded at the moment. And uh, the proposal does not consider how to ensure small holders we don't have financial capacity and often know how will be able to comply with the regulation. Furthermore, the financial and banking sector are not included, as I just have said, and the legislation prescribes minimum sustainability requirement, but does not encourage companies to adopt best practices needed to achieve a nature positive climate safe world. That's why if you look, for instance, at the suggestion of the accountability framework, which are connected to our forest questionnaire as well, 
there are indications for companies to implement other sort of uh, fundamental action for uh, align with the internationally recognized best practices. Next slide, please. So we can argue that the level of ambition of the proposal is unprecedented. And, uh, but companies, uh, uh, while the legislative, legislative process advances, uh, companies and practitioners should ask themselves a question. What can we do now to uh, comply with the legislative requirement when they will be enforced? And we can now think together of potential answer and see also our organization like CBP or certification scheme like Proterra can support companies in this effort. Let me first start like with a brief introduction of CBP's work for those of you who are not familiar with the organization. Indeed, CBP is a nonprofit environmental organization, is running the global environmental disclosure platform, which is like the largest collection of corporate data on environmental impact on, uh, on the world. Disclosure and transparency are the foundation of the work of CDP, and we collect information regarding climate change, deforestation, water security issues, but with an ambition to expand our scope to other environmental issues by 2025 and create like a metrics that can tackle the interconnection between the different teams, as I would mention a couple of examples later. And uh, uh, CDP is collecting this information to be shared with two main groups of stakeholders, which are like 680 institutional investors supporting CDP, representing more than 130 trillion of, of assets managed by them, and purchasing companies that through the supply chain program request information from more than 24,000 suppliers from around the globe to report on environmental risk opportunities and impacts. As a result, this year we had 13,000 companies representing 55% of the world market capitalization with, who have disclosed environmental information through uh, the first questionnaire. So next slide, please. In 2021, we had 865 companies scattered around the world that have disclosed to CDP on forest, resulting in a 26% overall growth since the previous year. And suppliers have surpassed again the rate of disclosure of companies responding to investors, underscoring the immense influence of the power of procurement. So the power of purchasing companies and stimulating like adoption of standard upstream in the value chain. But who are these companies? Uh, next slide, please. Many business sector and corporate supply chains are exposed to deforestation. Therefore, through our questionnaire and capacity building resources, webinars, workshop, CDP guided companies in understanding uh, their exposure to deforestation risk. Fat commodities that are used as key ingredients are found in a wide range of industry and everyday products. There is a huge misconception that deforestation is only driven by few sectors. For instance, how many are aware of the exposure to soy driven deforestation of the pharmaceutical sector? In fact, the pharmaceutical sector uses soy lecithin as an emulsifier for its stabilizing properties and there can be like an embedded business risk. Next slide, please. So CDP is working providing like a forest questionnaire that is a framework of action for companies to measure manage forest related risk and opportunities, transparently report on progress and commit to proactive action for the restoration of forests and ecosystem. This is not only a reporting tool, but a logical framework that is helping companies to be guided in the journey to remove commodity-driven deforestation from the value chains. And we constantly keep it updated and aligned with the accountability framework that you may know that is like the international standard for corporate uh, action and reporting uh, in terms of achieving a sustainable supply chain, deforestation-free supply chains. And uh, next slide, please. So, 
now we come like to a more technical aspect of the presentation and uh, we uh, did select like the most important data points of the forest question all are important but like a selection of the fundamental ones and we have defined 15 key kpis that are aligned as well with the accountability framework and they are allowing companies to set a strategy for establishing deforestation free restorative supply chains the kpis cover fundamental actions that companies must implement to measure manage and reduce their environmental impact on forest and land and the pathways start from governance you see here on the left side, highlighting the importance of having board level oversight of forest related issues. This ask is actually aligned with uh, what the CFD requires for climate. And then we move to what the necessity to have like a strong forest related policy, which should be company wide, so direct operation and supply chains, and it should uh, uh, implement like important environmental criteria and a company-wide as well, time-bound with strong cut-off date for a specific commitment, which should be as well commodity-specific. And uh, these KPIs then form what is like the basis of the strategy must then be translated into a business plan that allow companies to measure and forecast the risk and plan how to manage them. And you see like the number five KPIs is dedicated in fact to risk management. And uh, for then going with the implementation of the business strategy towards actually the targets. And uh, so finally, we arrived to measuring the impacts of action through the different types of time bound and measurable targets. We start from certification, which plays a fundamental role in enabling a company to ensure that the production of forest risk commodity does not lead to deforestation and other environmental pressures. And this gives us the chance to reflect on the role of certification can have in supporting companies to, to comply with the EU legislation. Indeed, Proterra's, for instance, segregated chain of custody model can allow company to retrieve information on the region of the soil and will ensure that will be respected the certification principle. This can be a call to action also not for companies only to adopt certification, but also for certification schemes to ensure that the way that they are providing the information to customers are actually aligned with potential legislative requirements. And the other targets that are part of our pathways are related to the ability of companies to trace commodity to origin, assess the volume of commodity in compliance with commitments and with national legislation. But in the next year of two, we will integrate in our questionnaire the possibility to disclose a new type of targets whose methodologies will allow companies to work holistically on certain environmental issues. And I want to mention two in particular. The SBTI flag methodology that will allow company to set a science-based target uh, with this flag methodology to measure and commit to, uh, commit to the reduction of emission coming from the land system. Therefore, it will be applicable to companies with uh, uh, supply chains linked to forest, agriculture, land use, and land use change. And another parent, let's say, initiative, uh, the one of the SBTS uh, for nature, so science-based target for nature, that will have a similar approach to the SBTI for climate and for the flag methodology, but will allow companies to uh, measure their impact on nature-related issues, such as biodiversity, ecological connectivity, uh, water, soil pollution, and others. Uh, we can share like some kind of resources to guide you towards like these uh, new uh, upcoming methodologies that will indeed be immediately uh, implemented also in the reporting framework of CDP. Uh, to conclude here, like if we look on the on the right side, we have seen like the KPIs dedicated to value chain engagement. It is absolutely important to engage direct supplier, indirect supplier, and smallholders to work collectively in building up capacity. Next slide, please. 
and uh, how does CDP help companies to do so? With us, what we call like the supply chain program, it is a membership that support companies to engage suppliers, open risk and identify opportunities. We have more than 200 members worldwide. They use the program to set and achieve science-based target, zero deforestation commitments, water security targets. And as we have seen before, they engage more than 24,000 uh, suppliers. And CDP supply chain members can be a, a, a membership, sorry, can be a useful tool in supporting companies to comply with the upcoming legislative, legislative requirements as well. And how can we do that? I give you like some example with the next slide. So uh, the, the CDP supply chain team works side by side with the member companies, supporting them in different ways, like working with the members to identify like a supplier list of the key supplier according to spend, high risk for us commodity industry and suppliers who operate like in high risk countries and so on. The, the, definition of the list is quite uh, customizable. Then the supplier engagement through CDP platform is obviously helping to share technical guidance document, a multilingual health center for any kind of supplier inquiries. Then for the member can also define pathways for deforestation pre supply chain, selecting some of those KPIs that I have mentioned. And then Obviously, CDP is collecting data through the platform and uh, including customer related uh, details, for instance, on the percentage of certified volume sold, collaborative project and opportunities, and emissions from uh, land. We can then provide data analysis, aggregated and tailored data outputs, action actionable and tailored feedback to that actually can help you like to inform the procurement strategies and also benchmark against peers and track and obviously the, 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 the performance of the suppliers over here. Next slide, please. So after this long, uh, uh, before concluding, actually, I want to introduce you to one initiative of CDP, the Nature Positive Challenge. Next slide, please. And this Nature Positive Challenge want to uh, connect companies together to implement collaborative forest and land use projects. So all companies disclosing to CDP on forest can participate by submitting a proposal through a dedicated website. There is like a simple project proposal template that you can submit, it is for free and can give like the, the chance to CDP to work as a mediator and connect the submitting company with any kind of supplier or peers that the company would like to collaborate with. And we start act as a facilitator to uh, create the connection, but also to connect the companies with technical partners that can support the development of the project and the implementation of the project, such as Rainforest Alliance, which is a very much trustworthy organization. And uh, um, we can also connect potential, with potential third party funders that are willing to invest in certain type of project. With, by joining the challenge, the company will receive multiple benefits, as I have mentioned, and they will effectively support uh, actually like a collective action to realize project to achieve uh, zero deforestation commitment and to work towards a forest positive future. You can visit the website to find more information. Next slide, please. And after like this uh, relatively long presentation, I want to share with you like a, a last message, which is like that to achieve a nature positive climate safe world, we must act timely now and at scale, and to do so collaboration is necessary. So we cannot do it alone, and we need all of you and all like the collaboration possible. Thank you for the attention and back to you, Emisa. Thank you so much for this very informative presentation and very valid closing notes. I would like to remind our participants that they have the possibility to send us questions yeah, by using the chat. So um, please don't hesitate to do so. And now I would like to give the floor to Jasper, who will focus on more the consumer 
perspective and the environmental footprint labeling. Yes. Like to take Thanks, over. Amid and Marco. Um, yeah, um, if you can provide me the um, the sharing. Yeah, now I have the ability to share my screen. I believe you now see my screen. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you, the floor is Good. Here. And I can start. So, welcome everyone. Uh, many thanks. Um, I will uh, talk about approximately 15 minutes about uh, an, an environmental footprint labeling. So the current landscape, the current status, what is behind, what are the building blocks uh, um, of that uh, footprint and um, where to go. Uh, my name is Jasper Scholten, as Amazing explained, uh, and I work since 2008 at Blond Consultants, and I'm leading a team of approximately 12 consultants. So this is the contents, what I will explain. First, a little bit about uh, Blond Consultants, the company. So um, what is our, our expertise and our services? I will provide an overview of some uh, label in initiatives, which you maybe already have heard in the news or in the retail. Then I will explain something about the, the building blocks needed. So on standards and data, and also on the coming policy developments. And last but not least, some considerations and limitations. And yeah, so first of all, uh, Blanc. So uh, Blanc, uh, we are a small company, but uh, we are really specialized in quantifying the uh, the impact of agriculture, food, and diets. And the method we are using is uh, an uh, footprinting, or sometimes it's also called LCA. Uh, life cycle assessment, and we are specialized in um, creating databases, software solutions, and also helping industry in um, creating a level playing field. So, um, with the rules on how to conduct these studies, um, we have a growing team of approximately forty. Uh, specialists, so consultants, software developers, and data and model specialists. And we are an international company, so we work for, um, yeah, in the US, uh, Latin America, uh, Europe, um, and then for NGOs, multinational, uh, multinationals, research institutes, and but all over the, uh, the life cycle of, uh, and food. Then a couple of our services, what we do, so um, performing footprint studies or helping companies in setting a target. Um, you also see here the creation of databases and also quite um, relevant creating um, a level playing field with industries. I will explain also later on in my presentation a couple of, a couple of these services. You will recognize them uh, and back. And then an overview of labels. So um, the label footprint label initiatives. Um, first of all, an old um, slide, um, which I used in 2015 when uh, the um, European Commission just started up uh, the first steps in creating a level playing field on footprinting. So the product and product and environmental footprint category rules, which they finalized in 2018. Um, but here you see um, yeah, in, uh, uh, from the Guardian, that's a question mark, will there be half cycle uh, footprints for every product in the future? So this was uh, seven years ago. And if you look now at the current situation, is that indeed um, in, the super, super, in the supermarket, you see it more and more that um, we are confronted with these kind of um, eco labels. 
uh, if it's the planet score, the eagle score, um, you name it. So they look quite familiar, like, uh, uh, for instance, the Nutri score. So with this A, B, C, D, E uh, and color scheme. Um, but it is now happening, for instance, in France, uh, Germany, Belgium, and last week also a Norwegian um, retailer, online retailer, they um, yeah they brought the news that uh, because they implemented this label, they saw the um, yeah the the, uh, the the sales of products with a high impact, for instance uh, beef or uh, lamb meat, they saw it quite uh, reduced the sales. So it could mean that it, it indeed indeed helps to uh, to reduce. Um, then uh, a little bit more constructive overview. So what we currently could identify are the most, maybe the most relevant ones are listed here. First of all, that there is an, um, an Euro European initiative, um, an, an uh, citizens initiative, um, which states that um, they wish to have a kind of footprint label, which is consistently assured and also uh, communicated to consumers. There is currently not a specific content yet, uh, um, so how to do it, but it's more like a wish. And I will later on talk about um, yeah another initiative from the European Commission, which is a link to this um, yeah a question request from uh, Europeans. Citizens. Then in France, there are some initiatives, for instance, the Planet Score and the Eagle Score. Uh, I, I believe that the, the, the most famous now is the Eagle Score, which is already implemented by Colorado and Lidl uh, and some catera, uh, catering companies, I believe. Then in the UK, there is Foundation Earth, which is currently also in a pilot phase of uh, providing these kind of footprint labels uh, to consumers. Then uh, first something about uh, the footprint. So what is behind that A, B, C, D, E uh, label or that number? So uh, footprinting, it's, an, um, uh, it's uh, quantifying the impact through the whole hives cycle so you're taking the whole life cycle into account um, if, for instance if we talk about uh, dairy production um, the um, cultivation of the feed the processing of the feed materials transport the dairy farm itself making the milk packaging food losses and the end of life of the product itself you try to take everything into account you try to embed all the input, all the inputs, all the emissions outputs, you try to embed that. Um, one, the, the most famous impact indicator is that's the carbon footprint, but you, you, you can also quantify, for instance, land use, eutrophication, water use, water scarcity. There's, so there's a quite a broad uh, spectrum of uh, impacts which you could quantify. So it's a holistic approach, and we yeah we try to take um, as much as possible into account at least the most relevant um, uh, inputs, outp uh, outputs, and life cycle stages. Then, what do you need for this? So to create this um, footprint or this LCA, you can um, yeah. It looks a bit like um, like a road. So you've got uh, a, uh, the road, and you've got traffic rules, vehicles, and fuels um, to go from A to B. So the and you can compare the road and traffic rules with LCA standards. And in those LCA standards, those are um, listed listing the rules, for instance, on how to deal with renewable um, energy or how to uh, how to deal with um, the allocation between soybean meal and soybean oil or how to assess land use change so the deforestation within your lca um 
then if you have set all the rules, then of course you also need LCA tools. It can be Excel, can be a specific software. I will not focus on that further in this presentation. Um, and then last but not, not least, but one of the most relevant um, inputs of such a footprint is data. With LCA, uh, crap in is crap out, of course. So, um, and you can split the data in um, the date, so the company specific data or supply chain specific data. So, um, for instance, when you talk about uh, the, a crusher, so how much uh, hexane has that, has that crusher used or what's how much oil is coming out, how much meal is coming out. So really the uh, specific um, uh, data of a certain company in the life cycle. And that crusher could maybe also uh, has access to uh, cultivation data. So what's the yield of soybeans, which fertilizers are used, which pesticides are used, that kind of activity data. Um, but you can, within an LCA, because you try to cover all life cycle stages in the complete life cycle, you can never collect the data of the complete supply chain. So you also always need to rely on background data. For instance, the what's the impact of one kilowatt hour, uh, which the crusher is, is using. So that kind of information is often coming from uh, background, uh, data, data, LCA background data, data, data places. So it is a little bit of an overview, and now I will go a little bit deeper into one and three. So the LCA standards and the data. Um, one, I think most relevant uh, standard, that's the product and environmental footprint standards. So it started in 2013 that the commission decided to, to make such a standard to create a level playing field. Um, this, uh, the product and product and environmental footprint uh, rules were finalized in 2018. And approximately a, a month ago, they were uh, um, upgraded to a recommendation. Um, the, there is a general guideline with um, yeah, uh, horizontal rules, but there are also uh, multiple already industry specific standards. So, uh, and the, for instance, the dairy industry, the feed industry, the olive oil industry, they all have their own uh, product and uh, product and environmental footprints category rule. And those industry rules, they comply completely to the rules of the, to the general rules of the commission. Um, and yeah, the, the, and it's still a work, in, a work in progress. For instance, currently uh, they are in the uh, transition phase. Uh, I will also explain that a little bit more. Um, also good to mention it's multi-impact. So it's not only about um, uh, carbon footprints, but also about land, land use, eutrophication, acidification. So 16 impacts uh, can be quantified. I will also uh, show you the complete list in a minute. Um, and then the future, yeah, that's the, um, the question is what will happen with this recommendation? So probably what will happen is that they are currently um, creating a proposal, uh, a green claim, it's called the Green Claims Initiative, which uh, it's legislation for which they will want to um, afford uh, greenwashing. They want to create a level playing field. So more strict rules. Probably um, is that the uh, product and product and environmental footprint rules will be the basis of that um, legislation. But the question is if it will be voluntary finding or that's still a bit the question now. Um, yeah, so in 2018, what, I, what I've explained, they uh, finalized together with uh, approximately 26 industries, they finalized the, the pilot phase. They are currently in a transition phase 
in which they are investigating how to use those um, yeah, uh, rules in policy. Also, some other in industries are now connected. Um, they are making new databases and they were also uh, still improving yeah, the, the, the rules. For instance, there's an agricultural working group who's, um, yeah, um, who is um, um, uh, changing the rules or um, uh, is making them more explicit. And then in the end, there will be a policy implementation. Here you see the list, I will not go over it completely, but here you see the list of uh, what you can quantify. Uh, then the robustness is also listed, and I think it's uh, very relevant to also take that into account. For instance, the, and, uh, the uh, robustness level of one means a high robustness, and the level the robustness level of three means a low robustness level. So, um, this is good to, to take into account. I will also, in my last slide, I will come back to the, yeah, the quality, the robustness of, uh, of LCA. Then the, the next building block is you need databases. Um, and for the retail, um, they need databases of all their products, which they sell. So all agriculture and food products. So they need uh, uh, farm to fork databases. This is one example. Uh, it is a, a database uh, we are making and which we probably now also, um, we heard uh, yesterday, we, we will um, also provide this database and um, improve it to for the, um, for the EFSA, the European Food and Safety Association. And that will be the basis of, um, yeah, of the, the building block and hopefully also to that um, the uh, agri-food supply chains can um, embed their own primary data too. But there were also other databases, for instance, in France, there's the Agri-Police database, which is also used in the background for the EcoScore. Then in uh, Nordic regions, there is a database. In Holland, there is an, uh, a database from the government. So um, you, you see it in, in Almost every month there, there is a new uh, European country which uh, releases uh, such a database approximately. Then the policy develop developments. So there's a lot happening in, in Europe. So it's part of the Green Deal and or the Farm to Fork strategy. And here you see uh, the most relevant one is the European Green Claims Initiative. So that's what I've talked about of, on which probably the um, product and environmental footprint um, uh, methodology and data of the European Commission will be part of. And probably also um, in one of the first slides I showed is that there was this um, citizens initiative to come up um, with an um, yeah with a uh, footprint label and ho hopefully because what we now see is that every retailer every country is creating their own logo their own methods it's all a bit it's all based on lca but all, always a bit different so hopefully it, it will be more aligned uh, in the coming years and then there's also some country specific Policy. I think France is uh, quite far in it that uh, they have this climate law in France that uh, also states that uh, yeah um, the impact uh, uh, shall be con uh, communicated to consumers. Um, then the, my last slides, um, maybe the to my opinion the most relevant one is some considerations and limitations. So what we now see in the market at the retail is, I think is really a good initiative. Um, it's needed, consumers, consumers, they want it. And it's these initiatives, so footprint initiatives communi communicating to consumers. It means that um, you can reduce the impact of agriculture and food in two ways. You can uh, try to shift the, the buying habit of consumers so that they buy other products, 
or you can um, you, you, can, you can create incentives that the impact of the supply chain itself is reduced. For instance, with um, uh, land use change free products. Um, that's one example of, on how to reduce the, uh, the footprints table. Um, for the rest, I think it's quite relevant that um, LCA footprinting is not a holy grail. So you also need to understand the limitations of it. Um, a lot of the impacts are regional impacts and um, LCA could be quite uh, rough, quite, uh, quite rude, uh, especially for instance, when you do, do not take into account primary data of cultivation. So with, uh, with agriculture and food, cultivation is often a hotspot. So it's uh, extremely important, I would say, that um, the cultivation is based on primary data and not on data from uh, a, a kind of database which is based on statistics or literature and also relevant not everything can be measured um, then also again uh, please focus on supply chain specific data so the initiatives we now see in the market they are all based on uh, databases statistics literature um, so I would uh, uh, plea for uh, for a, a movement towards these labels but based on supply chain specific inf information um, because the current databases they are not robust enough not granular enough uh, and the quality is also it's not enough for consumer co communication and also um, if it's always uh, one number that number doesn't change when you um, when you create reductions in your supply chain so you can have a, a land use change free uh, product but if the retail still get a generic number out of a database, then yeah, it it doesn't help. Maybe also good offsetting, uh, for instance, carbon credits, uh, they are not allowed in uh, food printing. Um, then uh, what's also relevant is that more consistency is needed. So I've presented now one method, so the product and product and fermented footprint. But for instance, the, the greenhouse gas protocol, the SBTI and the flag, they also release some, um, some rules and there is uh, inconsistency in those. Then also within the European Commission, they try to, um, to align, to create a horizontal alignment within the industries. Because when you want to compare, for instance, um, uh, a meat alternative with a meat, you want to, to have the same rules. So currently, they there are a lot of the same rules, but there are still some inconsistency. So it's also good um, that that is aligned. Um, otherwise, you, it's not a fair com. It's not a fair com comparison, and maybe also good state. Um, so comparing products on a kilogram basis is always not a fair com person because you're not taking the nutrients into account water is completely something different than beef so hopefully but with a combination of the nutri score and the uh, the eco score or an eco or a footprint label this information this uh, nuance can be provided and then last but not least uh, please uh, try to avoid uh, in, in, involvement of uh, policies, um, for instance, what we see in the EcoScore, there are some uh, is based on LCA information, but there is also you, you can see it here also. There's also additional quality criteria, and one of those criteria is when it's produced local, then you get, get a reduction of your footprint, and th there I've got multiple examples that when you produce local it's not it, it even has a higher footprint so it it is not always true that um, producing local creates a lower footprint so i will try to avoid um yeah uh, those involvement and try to to base it on numbers and set of uh, assumptions or uh, yeah op op opinions 
Okay, um, let me have a look how much time we've got left. Um, nothing. This was also my last slide. So if you have questions, um, don't hesitate to contact me or the company. Then I see there, there are some questions in the chat. Maybe Emese, if you can. Uh, yes, uh, I can share the slides. Yes, uh, we will be, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we will share the slides um, and also the recording after. Um, and there is a question actually to Jasper. Yeah. Does this mean that when a supplier will sell the product, he will have to supply also the kilogram um, carbon equivalent data to according to the specific standard, for example? Yeah, well, what we now see is that that uh, the first steps are indeed uh, happening. That's um, that within the supply chain information is asked. And that could be not a kilogram CO2 equivalent, but that could more often be, uh, please provide all your inputs and outputs. So your, all, your whole, uh, so how did you create that product? Which packaging did you use? How much energy did you use? And then, uh, it is calculated for them, but yeah. So, but, but and the question is um, on the policy level. So, with this green claims initiative, yeah, uh, how much pressure that that will give? But yeah, it's uh, it's all quite new. So let's see how how it will go. Okay, I actually have a very quickly questions. I know we ran out of time, and many people have next following meetings already at uh, four o'clock. But um, just very quick, yeah, sorry, <laughs> quick last <laughs> and finalizing questions that many companies actually rely on certifications today. And, um, and, and uh, certifications often go beyond legal requirements. That's more connected to, I think, the presentation, Marco, but both of you are inv invited to answer the question. Why do you think um, certifications haven't been added as an element of the proposal? And do you accept actually or think that the standard benchmark will also be a part of the proposal, of the final version of the proposal? Uh, to be brief, uh, certification was included in the impact assessment exercise conducted by the European Commission in, uh, before the development of the draft. And uh, indeed, there were like different uh, options on the table, such as even the development of a uh, public certification scheme, which was opposed by the majority of uh, stakeholders, NGOs, uh, part of the multi-stakeholder platform, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, certification schemes have dedicated an enormous amount of resources to develop like uh, these standards companies have committed and they spent a lot of uh, money and capacity to ensure like a better certification of their products. So, there was not like the possibility to find like a, an agreement and obviously politics are involved in this case and uh, there was not the possibility to recognize one or like determined certification schemes uh, versus like uh, getting like a, a due diligence system that will uh, provide directly the authorities with the information required. So I think that uh, there may be like different reason, but indeed certification is playing like a incredibly important role. Uh, it's also like, a, as I was mentioning before, the uh, task of certification scheme to ensure that they communicate like the right information to their customer as much as possible in alignment with the le legislative requirements. And then we know that obviously they also support the implementation of best practices that go well beyond uh, regulatory uh, requirement, legislative requirements. Thank, thank you, Marco. We actually at Proterra we also publish um, an overview of how the Proterra certification addresses um, the proposal. So we are also waiting for the final mm -hmm. version. And a very last question, bear with me, yes, for one minute. Um, China is always a big question mark. Uh, and the last question I received is connected to China. Do you see uh, similar developments on terms of relevance um, of deforestation supply chains in China? So practically the question is, do you see 
um, similar developments coming to, you know, um, environmental developments on, on legislations or really private companies asking for deforestation free supply chains also in China. Both of you are free to answer the question. Mm, we are active in it, it, we, we are active in Asia, but that's more the supply chain towards Europe. So I just don't see that uh, we don't see a lot of happening. So Europe is really a front runner in this field. Marco, do you have many members from Asia, China? We we like we have a dedicated China office uh, that is working also directly in connection with the Ecological Ministry of the Republic of China, and uh, they are uh, um, like trying indeed to engage and to develop strategies uh, both for like uh, having like uh, companies working on the direct operation to tackle deforestation, but as well to create like supply chain connection with producer countries. We know how much of the soy produced in Latin America associated with deforestation is going uh, to, to China. Therefore, like uh, we have uh, an increasing investment of capacity in the, in the region. And uh, I can say that we have uh, a more, a, around 60 companies disclosing on forest in China, and they are trying to step up on mission and to implement uh, uh, forest commitments. And uh, we have like developed uh, the so-called forest club where they are like meetings uh, with companies sitting in round tables and discussing collective approaches. Much worse must be done, but uh, there are like few little encouraging uh, signals now. Right. No, no, positive to hear because only last year there were more than 60 million tons exported only from Brazil, from soybeans to China. So thank you everyone who bared with us uh, despite the time. Thank you for your participation. It was lovely to have you here together and great, special thanks for our presenters, Marco, Jesper, and um, wish you a wonderful day and see you soon. Yes, many thanks, Amelia. Good luck. Thank you, everyone. Thank Take you very care. much, everyone. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye-bye.